The Lord be with you. I invite you to turn with me in your copy of Holy Scripture to the first chapter of Exodus. Reading Exodus chapter 1 verse 8 through chapter 2 verse 10. Exodus chapter 1, beginning with verse 8. Now a new king rose over Egypt, who did not know Joseph. He said to his people, Look, the Israelite people are more numerous and more powerful than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, or they will increase, and in the event of war, join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore they set taskmasters over them to oppress them with forced labor. They built supply cities, Pithon and Ramses for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread, so that the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites. The Egyptians became ruthless in imposing tasks on the Israelites and made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and in every kind of field labor. They were ruthless in all the tasks that they imposed on them. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Sifra and the other Pua, When you act as midwives to the Hebrew women and you see them on the birth stool, if it is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, she shall live. But the midwives feared God. They did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but they let the boys live. So the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this and allowed the boys to live? The midwives said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwives come to them. So God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and became very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, Every boy that is born to the Hebrews you shall throw into the Nile, but you shall let every girl live. Now a man from the house of Levi went and married a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was a fine baby, she hid him three months. When she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him, plastered it with bitumen and pitch. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds on the bank of the river. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. The daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river, while her attendants walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her maid to bring it. When she opened it, she saw the child. He was crying, and she took pity on him. This must be one of the Hebrews' children, she said. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get you a nurse from among the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Yes. So the girl went and called the child's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child and nurse it for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed it. When the child grew up, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and she took him as her son. She named him Moses, because, she said, I drew him out of the water. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? And now, O God, may we hear what you would have us to hear. That we may do what you call us to do. That we may be the people you call us to be. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, a few days ago, I found myself in in a situation that's becoming extremely common for me. I was standing uh, in a closet. Uh, I was standing in the closet in Cole's bedroom. Cole was standing there with me, his hand over his mouth, trying to suppress like just bursting out in giggles. The little folding doors were closed, and right outside the door was Sally. And Sally was saying, where's Cole? 
where's data? And Cole's just, you know, trying to be quiet, but at the same time not really being quiet, you know. And when Sally opened the doors, he just started busting out laughing, and we fell on the floor, all three of us kind of giggling and carrying on. Happens way too much. You think. What's funny about it is Cole will do it. He said, I'm going to go hide and then do it right in front of you as if you're not going to know where he went, right? That sort of spatial cognition, I guess. But I remember, for some reason, later on that night, or it may have been the next morning, that situation came to my mind. You know what I'm talking about, right? When those times in your life when, for whatever reason, your brain decides, I've got to take a picture of this. I've got to save this to the hard drive. I've got to take a picture of this and post it on my mind's Instagram feed, right? Like this moment that makes really no sense in context, but for some, or out of context, but for some reason your brain says, I've got to remember this. And I can't remember if it was in the morning uh, in my time of prayer or maybe in those, those sort of special hours, you know, those, those rare moments when you're going to bed and, and everything is off and it's dark and you haven't given in to sleep yet, that time when your spirit is most sensitive to listening to God. And I remember, I remember asking myself, how did I get here? Right? How did that happen? How did I wind up in this place? How did I wind up in this situation? It's weird how it happens to you, right? Sometimes you might be in line at the bank, mundane as it is, and all of a sudden, all of the coincidences, all the the incidents and accidents of life all sort of begin to, to lay out in your mind for some reason, and you wonder, how did I get right here, right now? How? I think we we don't ask that question enough, that we don't stop enough in our lives, especially in moments worth savoring, worth understanding to ask, how did we get here? Sometimes we just take the moments and the stories for granted. I thought about that when, when I read this, frankly, long passage in Exodus. I wanted to just get to the end because I've read the Bible uh, many times, as some of you have. I've read it enough. I've heard the story enough. I, I watch it every Easter and Passover with Chuck Heston, right? And, and Yul Brenner. I know the story. Just get to where it's going. This is Moses. Get to where it's going. And at the end, Moses is drawn out of the water. And I go, thank God, we're at, we're at that point. Now we can move the story forward. But sometimes we have to wait. What led to getting us here? You know, the text we read this morning starts, A new king, a new pharaoh, arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. Most folks don't know Joseph. If you ask them who Joseph is, they'll go, Uh, the fellow with the coat? Maybe? Right? That's if you know something about Joseph. We talked a little about Joseph last week. His 11 brothers, jealous of him, sold him to some some Ishmaelites who wound up selling him to the Egyptians. He stays there some two decades, arises through the ranks, becomes the vizier of Egypt. Over all of the grain bins, all the stores that they'd had in the midst of famine. Does a lot of good things. Has 70 kids. 70. And then a pharaoh comes along. I don't know who that is. That's crazy. What if the Pharaoh had remembered? Oh, that's Joseph. We have a special place for his people. How things would have gone differently? I wonder. But a Pharaoh arises who doesn't know Joseph. He looks out, sees all the Israelite people, and there are a lot of them. He's worried. There are a lot of them. They might rise up. Isn't it odd? Our insecurities lead us to the worst case scenario. The Pharaoh arises and says, you know what might happen? You know what just might happen? They might rise up and join our enemies and take over. Or they might leave and take most of the economy with them. We can't let it happen. So he divides them, puts taskmasters over them. And when they still keep going, when they still keep having children, when they still keep getting stronger, what does he do? This isn't enough. Let's bear down on them. Make their work harder. But what if he hadn't done that? What if it had gone differently? 
What if it had slowed down the, the rapid expansion of the Israelite people? Oh, well, I guess the Egyptians are okay. I guess they're not that bad. Let's let them be. Let them be. They can be our workforce, but pay them a nice wage. They're not going to take us. What if it had been different? But they keep rising. He's scared. And I love, I love this little scene. It's easy for us to look over. The Pharaoh calls in the midwives. And we're given two of their names. Now, that's odd. That's a, women, I'm sorry, it's just the way it, it, it was back then, and I hate it, and I know it's wrong, but women didn't get a whole lot of press. And so midwives especially, you could have, you could have women who had families who were considered productive, and then you had the midwives right at the bottom. The most powerful man in the world, Pharaoh, calls the lowest level human and says, you've got to do this. And we're told, too, of their names. Now, they're not particularly great names, Pua and Sifra, but it's their name. And he calls them in and tells them, look, when, when, you're, when, you're give, when you're there helping them give birth, if it's a boy, kill it and let the girls live. Do you see the irony in that? Let the girls live. Is there a single male in this story who's a hero? Come on, man. Are there any men in this story? No. Women, are there any women who are heroes in this story? Let the girls live. Pharaoh might come to regret that. But they say they, they don't do it. And I love it. It's humorous, isn't it? Right. Pharaoh says, how can you do this to me? They go, well, the Egyptian women, they're sissies. The Egyptian women need a, a week in a birthing suite with an epidural and time to recover. But the Hebrew women, no, they have birth in the morning or back out in the field in the afternoon. We can't help it. The Hebrew women are just tougher. Just how it is, Pharaoh, your people are weak. That's the, the drive of the story. But it takes an ugly turn, right? Now, what if, what if the midwives had given in? The lowest, weakest people give in to the most powerful man in the world and kill all the baby boys. It could have gone differently. But Pharaoh takes this sort of private edict. It would have been as if, as if the president had sent a letter to all the maternity wards in the country and said, all right, now, now all of you OBGYNs, all of you uh, maternity nurses, listen, if a boy is born, just take it out back and kill it. Leave the girls alone. And when it doesn't happen now, it's a national press release. Listen, Egyptians, my people, if you see a Hebrew boy walking around, just kick him in the Nile. Just pick him up and throw him in the river. And what's more to that is it's not just throw him in the river, the closest one. It's the Nile, a god. There's a little bit of a, a religious tinge to that. Sacrifice that Hebrew child to our Egyptian god. Get rid of him. It goes from a private sort of, let's just keep this between us, all of us in the profession, to now it's a national problem. We've got to get rid of him. It could have gone different. But it doesn't. A Levite man and a Levite woman come together. It's important. Levites, the chosen people of God, right? Within the, within the tribes, these are the, the elites, according to God. And they have a son, a fine baby, it says, when he's three months. She puts him in a papyrus basket. Do you know what that word is in Hebrew? It's the exact same word for ark. They put Moses in an ark and they cover it with pit. Who else was in an ark covered with pit? Somebody else. My mind is slipping a little bit in my old age. Um, somebody else was in an ark set out on the water among the reeds. And there he goes. Could have been different. Think of all the things that could have happened. Just put the baby in the basket and trust it to the river. Just trust it to the river and there it goes. I've heard there are alligators in the Nile. That would have made for a more interesting story, but a much shorter one, I think. He could have just floated out and landed on the other side, and an Egyptian walking along says, wait a minute, there's a Hebrew boy in that basket. I better poke some holes in it. It's supposed to drown him. It could have gone any numbers of ways. It could have floated on down the Nile all the way. Moses' sister could have come back and said to her mother, I'm sorry, but the basket got away from me in the current. I'm sorry, but there were gators. I'm sorry, there was something else. It could have gone any other way, but instead it winds up where? 
Pharaoh's daughter. There, he's pulled Moshe, Moses, from the water in a basket. And his sister goes to get all of who, uh, who of all people, but Moses' mother, to nurse him until he's of age. And an Egyptian gives him a Hebrew name, which is odd. Moshe. Moses. Now we get there. But think of all the little incidents and accidents along the way that get Moses, that gives us Moses. We know Moses. We know that story. We want that story. But we don't stop to think about all the little things that happen along the way. And I don't want you to hear me say that all these bad things, Pharaoh killing babies, telling the midwives to kill babies, don't you ever hear me say that God wants that to happen. I am not one of these people, and if you are, we can agree to disagree, but I am not one of these people who believes that God wants bad things to happen, that God wills bad things to happen, that God wants evil things to happen, especially to our brothers and sisters, especially to one another. But what I do believe is that when bad things happen, God can always bend that road around towards something better and towards something good. And so when I look at Moses' story and I go, oh, we're at Moses. And then I look back down the road, not only at all the things that could have gone worse, not only at all the things that could have been bad and how God bent the road, but I look at all the people, the last ones you'd expect. I'd expect in this story for some, for some great man of Israel to stand up and to come out and say, no, no more, Pharaoh. We're not going to take this and a great rebellion rise up from the Israelites. But no, it's the midwives. The lowest women who stand up to the most powerful man. I expect it to be fathers who stand up and say, I will not let my children be thrown into the river and drown. But instead, it's a mother and a sister who put their baby, their baby brother, in an ark to protect him. I would expect it to be anything else. But here it is. And so I ask myself, when I'm standing in the closet with my three-year-old son who's giggling, how did I get here? And I go back and I look at my life at all the places where it could have been worse, where it could have gone differently, where my basket could have floated down the Nile, but it didn't. All the places where something bad and awful and terrible happened, or those places where the last person I'd expect to pull me out of the water pulls me out. When the last person I'd expect to knock me back in line with what God wants, God's plan, that last person I expect comes along. And so I wonder, as you're sitting in this room this morning, most of us, we do it every week. We take the time for granted, don't we? That we can come and just sit in this pew, listen to Chris jibber-jabber, then we can go eat some chips and salsa, go to strut, do something. We take it for granted every week that we can come in this place and sit down and life will be the same tomorrow on through until next Sunday. But I want you to take this moment right now, right now. Put away your phone, stop bubbling in the bulletin, put down the hymn or whatever you're doing. Stop right now. And think, how did I get here? How did I get to this place? This moment in my life right now. And look back. I'm not telling you this moment's even great. This moment right now, you may be going through your own personal hell this morning. You may be sitting in this pew going, I don't want to keep this up. I don't want to keep going. But stop and think, what led you to this point right now? This may be the best day of your life. You may have got the best news you've heard all year, all decade this morning. You may be sitting in here right now just shaking in the pews, bubbling over with excitement. But stop and think, how did I get here right now? And look back at all the incidents and accidents that led to this point. And if it's awful, Pray, Lord, help me to straighten out. Help me to get out of this rut, to pull out of this turn, to for God to straighten the road back the way you want it to be. 
Whether it's in relationships with people in your life, whether it's something you've done, whether it's something you're not doing. Lord, just help me get out of this and into the next time. Or if you're here and it's the greatest day ever, if you're on a gravy train with biscuit wheels, take a moment and look back. and See what incidents and accidents, what un, un, uncharacteristic people led you to this point, And then just say, thank you. Thank you. But every so often, in those moments, those mundane moments when you take life for granted, when it's just another part of the story, when it's just another woman pulling Moses out of I know how the story goes, I know how it goes, when it's just one of those times in your life, stop and look back. Reflect. Tell God thank you. Or ask God to pull you out of whatever it is you're in. May you do that right now as we take this time to listen to the Spirit of God and respond to God's presence among us. Do that as we pray. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on us, O oh Lord, when we take the mundane moments of life for granted. Have mercy on us, Lord, when we are in the depths of the dark valley. <coughs> Have mercy on us, Lord, when we are at the height of the mountain. And remind us of all those things that you, or that you straightened out to get us to the times of joy. And Lord, remind us that you are the one who will straighten out all the times that lead us into the depths. God, help us throughout our day today and the week to come, each day of our lives, to just pause for a moment, perhaps in those quiet hours before sleep, in the early hours of the morning or in our drive to work, Help us, God, to take just a moment to reflect on our lives, to say thank you. Or if we need, Lord, to say help me. And so, God, in this time, as we listen for your spirit to move, help us, God, to look back, to say thank you, to say help me, to look back on all the incidents and accidents in our lives. To see them not as caused by you, but to see or in those times where you move to make us more and more like your son Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen.